Hi. All right, so with today's lecture, I'd like to talk a little bit about the self as a social process. And uh, to do this, I'm going to introduce the theories of two social psychologists uh, working at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, George Herbert Mead, who was at the University of Chicago, and Charles Cooley, who was at University of Michigan. These guys are kind of working in parallel. They're uh, coming up with um, sociologically informed theories of the self that actually have quite a lot of overlap, although they're uh, there are also conceptual differences um, that, that make them distinct in their own right. So um, I'll start with Mead, um, specifically uh, his notions of what we call the I and the me. Now, um, as I said, George Herbert Mead uh, is a sociologist. He's at the University of Chicago. He's um, broadly interdisciplinary um, in his training and his background and his interests, and um, he is keen to develop um, uh, what, what he calls a social psychology, uh, um, a sort of um, analysis of the uh, individual, but explicitly from a sociological standpoint, um, uh, rather than from a, a psychological standpoint. Um, he's profoundly influenced by a number of key uh, um, psychologists and sociologists from Europe, <clears throat> And maybe most importantly, he's pushing back against um, the dominant model in uh, psychology at the time, which was behaviorism. Um, so if you've taken a course in psychology, you might know um, B.F. Skinner, a very famous um, uh, behaviorist. Um, Skinner comes along later, so, so um, Mead is actually reacting in many ways to the work of Pavlov. Um, who you've probably also heard of if you've taken an intro to psych class. Um, and the, um, the model, the behaviorist model of, of, of uh, human action was that um, our behavior is essentially, is essentially a series of conditioned responses to stimuli in our environment. <clears throat> so we get this external stimuli, which provokes a, um, a conditioned response or a conditioned reaction. And Mead thinks um, that there's a little bit more to it than this, that there is an, inter that there is an intervening um, step um, that is absolutely critical to understand if we are going to understand human behavior, um, and that is a, a sort of interpretive um, space in between our experiences of, of things in our environment um, and how we choose to respond, right? That our responses aren't merely conditioned, but rather they reflect a kind of careful consideration of um, um, the situation itself, what the situation means, uh, possibly understanding that the situation might have multiple meanings depending on the individuals in the interaction, um, understanding that people will interpret and understand particular behaviors in different ways, right? So it's a much more complex uh, sort of model of, of human cognition than stimulus response, stimulus response. So he, um, he sort of embarks on sort of unpacking that intermediate step and sort of asking, um, you know, what goes on here? What are the resources that are involved? Um, and he's, he's building what will become um, a, a paradigm within so, uh, sociology called symbolic interaction. Because um, interaction is the, the, the fundamental element of, of, of social organization, um, and it's mediated through symbolic exchange, right? So through the exchange of things like language and shared meaning. Um, and that language and shared meaning become critical elements in that interpretive process. All right, so for all of this to work, a couple of things have to be in place. Uh, the first is that we need to be capable of, of something he calls reflexive behavior. Now, reflexive behavior is behavior in which the person initiating an action is the same as the person toward whom the action is being directed. So if I am hitting myself, right, I am the one that's doing the hitting, but I'm also the thing that's being hit, right? So think about that, but internal, right? So when you think about yourself, you are doing the thinking, but you are also the thing that you are thinking of, right? So that's what reflexive behavior is. It's, it's an internal sort of direction of, of cognition or thought toward oneself. 
Um, because we have this innate capacity, right? Mead believes that this is something that all human beings are born with. Um, you know, the ability to be self-aware um, is, is sort of hardwired, and not just in human beings, right? That it also seems to be a capacity that other, um, certainly primates, um, but also other mammals and, and perhaps other kinds of animals um, 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 experience as well. But human beings absolutely have this capacity, and human beings have done a tremendous amount with that capacity. Um, so reflexive behavior is innate. It is something that we are born with. Um, because we can do this, we can, in essence, look at our self, right? We can direct action like cognition or thought toward ourself. So in other words, we can consider our self. Um, and to sort of illustrate this, Mead sort of divides the self up into two parts, right? One is the active source of, um, of that behavior. The other is the passive object of that behavior. And he calls these two parts the I and the me. Um, so we use the I to look at me, to look at ourself. I look at me, right? So that's where we get these terms. Now, remember, the ability to do this is innate, but if we don't learn um, the perspective of social others, we can never look at ourself from those perspectives. So role-taking, which is one of the things that we can do with this capacity for reflexive behavior, uh, involves us taking on the role of another to look at things from that person's point of view. And one of the things that we can look at from that other person's point of view is us. It's ourself. So we use our innate capacity for reflexive behavior and the socialized uh, understanding, the learning that we've engaged in that allows us to understand the perspective of other people. And we use that to consider ourselves, to consider our self from the perspective of other people. This is why at any given point in time, you can fairly accurately deduce how your mother might feel about what you're doing in that moment, even if your mother is not there to tell you, because you've got kind of a version of her living in your head, and you use that perspective and you use that standpoint to evaluate yourself. And it's not just your mother, right? It's also your understanding of mothers as a social role that is occupied by lots of different people. And that is, a, that is what allows you to sort of differentiate the behavior of mothers as a group from the behavior of your mother specifically. So when you sort of point out to your mother that, for example, she's not, um, she's not being reasonable, you're comparing her to the, to the expectations of other mothers and wondering why your mother isn't sort of in line with those expectations. You, you can't do that unless you have some broad understanding of, these, of these, uh, these social roles that other people occupy. You don't have to be a mother to see things from the perspective of a mother. You just have to learn what the perspective of mothers is. And that's something you can do through observation. It's something you do through the socialization process. It's something you do through years and years and years of experience with your mother, but also encountering other people's mothers as well. So Mead says <clears throat> that we use this perspective of, of another person, either a specific other person or um, a broad set of others, which I'll get to in just a moment, but we use those perspectives to sort of look at our behavior, even behavior we have not yet engaged in, right? Remember, we're talking about that interpretive process between uh, environmental conditions and, and behaviors. So we're going to look at, at, at you know, um, what we might do in response to this external condition, um, and understand how the people in the environment around us are going to see and understand the things that we do and say in response. So what we do to sort of formulate a strategy for how we are going to choose a behavioral response is we take into consideration the expectation of others. All right, so that's what we do. We learn social roles, which we then use because we have this innate capacity for reflexive behavior to see ourselves from the perspective of other people. All right. So Mead says that this self, this, and that is for him the self, right? The self is the thing that is thinking about itself, the active source and the passive object of behavior. And specifically in this case, the behavior is cognition, it's thinking. 
So he says that self develops. It's not something that we're born with, but rather something that that gets built over time. It gets built through um, social interactions and social experiences with a wider social world. In the absence of those social interactions, selves do not develop because we never acquire the perspective from which to evaluate our behavior. Right? So when we look at a case of like feral children, like Jeannie, a very famous example from Los Angeles in the 1950s, or we look at Danielle, who's uh, discussed in the chapter, we see uh, examples of, of, of children raised in the absence of social inputs. And, in, and children raised in the absence of social inputs don't develop selves. It's, it's just that simple. Um, all right, so how does this self develop? Well, he says it, it, it evolves or develops through a series of phases um, or what, what he calls stages. Uh, so he, he talks about uh, the preparatory stage, the play stage, and the game stage. Now, the preparatory stage is sort of a phase of socialization in which a child is going to engage in really basic interaction and really basic kinds of imitation. And, and it's helpful to think about um, sort of how a, a newborn human sort of acquires an, under, acquires an understanding of the world that, that they live in. Um, so imagine a child you know, relatively young, couple of months old, maybe, maybe um, um, three or four months old. Um, all the people in this, in this baby's social world, which admittedly is probably fairly limited to family and, 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 and neighbors and close friends, but nevertheless, that's still a pretty surprisingly large number of, of social others uh, for this little child to grapple with. So in these interactions, right, the kid is just sort of passively absorbing information about the world around them. But in that experience, they're acquiring all kinds of really, really useful insights, even if they're not consciously writing them in a journal or something. So, for example, one of the things that the child will learn is that the world is comprised of discrete and separate social objects, but that are still somehow connected. And, and what I mean by that is um, that when you are born, you probably don't realize that the world is made up of, of things that aren't you, right? You have no experience to, to sort of um, um, make that meaningful to you until you begin to have repeated experiences of particular kinds with that broader social world. So um, a, a baby you know, in a little baby carrier in a line at Starbucks, right? And people lean over the little baby and they, bah, 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 you know, baby talk and try to get the kid uh, to react, right? A smile, a giggle, a laugh. And um, the way you know, by the way, that that's what the, um, the, the, the adult is looking for is that when the child does smile or giggle or laugh, the adult goes, ah, I got the baby to laugh, right? So what the kid is learning is that these things that keep leaning over it and making all of these weird noises will alter their behavior when the child engages in some behavior, right? When the child cries or laughs or giggles or smiles, the behavior of this other object changes. Um, and that's one of the ways in which the kid is learning that, that these things aren't me, but they're connected to me through a kind of interactive relationship. And again, this is not conscious learning. This is not, uh, you know, Stewie from Family Guy writing things out in, in a journal. Um, the kid will learn that uh, these objects are differentiated not just from themselves, but from each other as well. So one of the objects that's going to lean over this kid and make a whole lot of noise might be um, mom, right? Another object uh, that leans over the kid and makes a lot of noise is, um, you know, your older brother. Um, and what differentiates your mom from your older brother are the things that they do and they say when they lean over you and they start to interact with you. So you start to realize that, um, you know, these objects aren't just separate from me, they're also separate from each other and they're, in, they're defined by the things they do and say. That's, those are social roles, right? You're learning social roles even if you're not consciously learning them uh, the way that we typically think of learning. So that's what's going on in the preparatory stage. And then, of course, that expands as you go out into the broader social world and, you know, you, you, you're, you're taken from your house to somebody else's house where there's also a little baby or a young child and you observe that other baby or that young child's mother doing things with that other person that your mother does with you and you have this moment of insight. Again, it's not conscious, it's not, you know, um, 
um, particularly um, overt learning, uh, but you begin to realize that mother isn't uh, idiosyncratic. It's not unique to, to your mother. It's a social role. It's a role that lots of other people play. You're going to learn, of course, that your mother is mostly like those other mothers, but different in some ways, just like your siblings will be like other kids' siblings, but, you know, different in some ways. Parents will be different. Uh, you know, you see, you see where I'm going with that. I mean, I hope you, you see where I'm going with that. Um, so at that point, and it's hard to say exactly when that happens. There's no time, there's no time data, um, for this, for this particular series of stages. One of the, uh, one of the comments and, uh, observations, um, done on, on Mead's work later on, uh, in the, in the 1980s and 1990s was uh, a recognition that it isn't, it isn't the age at which these things occur that matters. It's, the range and sophistication of social interactions, right? Um, um, feral children, you know, are often discovered in late adolescence or in their in their in their teenage years, um, and they don't have selves. They haven't developed a self, so it's clearly not a function of time. It's a function of interactions. You know, when you look at the the, the psychological theories of, of development, if you look at Piaget or Kohlberg or guys like that. Um, they're very sort of specific at zero to certain months, you know, you're in the, in the, you know, formal operational stage or, you know, all of those kinds of things are, are sort of time keyed. Um, but, but observations and commentary on, on Mead's work, I, I think also apply to people like Piaget and Kohlberg. Um, it's not the age, right? It's the range and sophistication of social interactions that one has had by the time they reach that certain age, right? So a typical pathway of development would involve a particular range and, and, and uh, uh, sophistication of, of interactions by six months or by a year and a half or whatever, you know, whatever time periods we're talking about. But it isn't the time. It isn't passage of time. It's what's happening in the passage of time. But at some point, uh, the kid who has kind of been immersed in this preparatory stage uh, now moves into what's called the play stage. And in the play stage, kids are going to start to take the role of specific others through kind of playing at those roles, right? So a kid playing house might grab a pot and a spoon and, you know, stir them around um, uh, one inside the other and, and say that they're cooking, right? Because they're playing the role of mother. Um, or they might do and say the things that they've heard um, their mother do, or they might do and say the things they've heard their father do, or, or you know, whoever the people in their lives um, happen to be. When I was a kid growing up in Oklahoma, um, when we would play house, somebody always wanted to be the tornado, right? So why not, right? You get to spin around and knock things over. Who wouldn't want to be a tornado? Um, my point here is that kids aren't these things. They are playing at these things. They're kind of imitating them, and they're making themselves broadly familiar with the behaviors, both the actions and the words uh, that comprise these that comprise these roles. When you reach a, a certain degree of, of, of familiarity, one of the things that you start to realize is that that people do and say the things they do in response to the things that other people are doing and saying. So these, these phrases and these behaviors aren't just sort of random occurrences. They occur within the context of interactions in which there is a set of social norms. Um, you know, a mother or a father might say, you know, wait till your, your, um, you know, your mother or your father get home. Um, and what that means might be um, that they're going to be very proud of the, the report card you brought home from school, or you might be in trouble, right? That that phrase is just a phrase, but its meaning and, and, and its, its presence in an interaction is a function of other things that are happening in that interaction, right? So, so mothers or fathers might cook, they might prepare a meal, but they're not going to do it randomly. They're going to do it at certain times of the day when other members of the family are going to be present in, in a relatively short period of time, right? So all of these actions uh, become more meaningful in that way. And when when that child realizes that all of these um, role behaviors sort of exist within a network of others, that's when the child has entered kind of what we call the game stage, um, in which um, it, it, it's still, you know, an understanding of a variety of roles and the behaviors that are associated with those roles, but that the behaviors that are associated with the roles uh, 
um, occur in response to the things that are happening um, um, as those roles interact with other roles. Um, Mead used to use the um, illustration of baseball games to sort of illustrate this, right? That you know, to, to play baseball, you have to be able to throw, you have to be able to catch, and you have to be able to hit. Um, those are the, the the roles, if you will, that that will make a person a good baseball player. Um, but knowing um, what everybody else on the team is going to be doing at a given point in time and how you should respond in the game at that moment based on that understanding is much, much more sophisticated than knowing how to throw or catch or hit. Um, all right, if somebody hits a baseball to a shortstop and there's a runner at first, the shortstop will pick up the ball and throw it to the second baseman, right? Even though there's nobody on second base, right? Because they understand that the runner at first is going to have to advance from first to second because the rules of the game dictate that behavior. You don't need to know anything about the person standing on first base except that they are standing on first base and a ball has been put in play, right? Because you understand the role of that other person, then you can anticipate their behavior. And because you can anticipate your beha their behavior, you can fit your behavior to that circumstance. You can throw it to second base knowing that the, second, the person playing second base is going to be standing there waiting to catch the ball because they have the same understanding of the game as everybody else. Right? So that's, that's what Mead is talking about when he says when you get to the game stage, you, you understand that role behavior doesn't exist in a vacuum. It exists in a network of, of, of social interactions and, and um, um, social others. And from there, we develop that broad, nonspecific other that he calls the generalized other that I alluded to a little bit earlier. And the generalized other is just the perspectives and the expectations of that social network. Right? So we don't have to think about what <clears throat> an individual friend of ours would think of us and then move on to think about what another individual friend of ours would think about us and then move on and think about what a third individual friend of ours would think about us. We can think about what our friends would think of us. We kind of lump them together and we use that general understanding of, of our friends. In this case, that would be something we call a reference group. Um, to inform our behavior. Now, understand, we don't have to do what social others want us or expect us to do. We have agency. We have the ability uh, to, to sort of act independently of those expectations. But we do so knowing how our, uh, those other people will respond to our deviation from their expectations. Um, what our parents expect of us and what our friends expect of us could be very divergent sort of expectations. And you may decide to do what your parents expect of you, even though you know it's going to disappoint your friends or vice versa, right? So knowing what other people expect of us isn't the same thing as giving in to their expectations. We use it to inform how we will proceed. And that's that interpretive um, middle step that, that Mead was suggesting was missing in that kind of behaviorist model uh, that, was, that was predominant in psychology at the time. That we read social situations, we define situations, if you remember back to uh, chapter two when we talked about definition of the situation, right? We define situations around us um, we infer, I think correctly, that people who share our culture, especially our language and our set of reference symbols, um, will be interpreting that situation in much the same way as we. Um, and then our behaviors are then going to be understood by those people in much the same way that we anticipate they would be understood. Right. So that's, that's how we use that interpretive step to sort of figure out how we're going to behave. So we have a situation that we interpret and understand. We consider courses of action, things that we might say, things that we might do. We choose a course of action knowing then how social others are going to be responding to that uh, in all likelihood. And we, we create what's called joint action. We create social interaction as a result of that. So that's, that's, again, that's what we can do with that capacity for reflexive behavior. We can use it to sort of build a foundation for, for social relationships. Now, Cooley is also looking at the self uh, in, in, in much the same way as this kind of process, this internal process of communication that's going on inside of our head. Mead talks about it as a kind of communication between the I and the me. Um, Cooley is talking about it as a conversation between our understanding of what people, um, um, how people are reacting to us and... Um, 
how we will then um, um, see ourselves based on on how they're how they're responding to us, or at least how we are interpreting their response to us. He calls this the looking glass self. It's the idea that our self or our self concept is a reflection of how we think other people see us. So he says we imagine how we appear to other people, and we have to imagine it, of course, because we are not privy to how other people see us. We don't have their senses. We have our senses. But based on people's reactions to us, we can interpret, sometimes you know, fairly accurately, and sometimes we get it wrong, but I would say most of the time we're pretty good at reading this, uh, especially if we have more experience. Um, we, we imagine right, how we appear to other people. We also imagine how people judge that appearance, right? Are the things that I'm doing and saying uh, appropriate or inappropriate, right? Do the, do the people around me, does their, does their reaction to me indicate that I should or should not be behaving in this way? And then, of course, the third step in the development of this looking glass self is um, the development of a self-concept um, um, that, that reflects how we interpret other people's um, interpretation of us. So if I'm explaining the looking glass self to a classroom full of students and I look out and this is the expression I see, right? They don't even have to tell me. I will stop and I will explain it again because I'm interpreting that facial expression as confusion. Um, and I'm not supposed to be confusing. I'm the teacher. So I understand that that's an inappropriate um, um, sort of self to have in fr in front of these people. And so I will go back and I will try to modify or adapt what they see by explaining or trying to elaborate. Uh, you can really sum up, and I, I love this, right? You can sum up Cooley's looking glass self um, as, as basically, I am who I think you think I am. Right? So I am who I think you think I am. Um, and it's, it's if you can remember that, if you can keep that phrase kind of clear in your head, I think it really nicely uh, summarizes and captures the essence of that looking glass self. Um, so again, right, just, you know, not that much different than, than, than Mead. Mead's talking about a kind of internalized understanding um, of social roles that we use to evaluate ourselves, and Cooley is talking about the way in which we use information that we're getting from people sort of in real time, if you will. Um, but essentially the process is the same. We're using that capacity for reflexive behavior to look at our self, but from the perspective of these other people, either uh, the familiarity we have with the social roles they occupy or our interpretation of their reactions to us in the case of Cooley. Uh, so I hope that makes sense. Um, next time, we'll talk a little bit about the self as a social structure. Um, if there are any questions, of course, just let me know, and I will say uh, take care until next time.